Well, thank, thank you, Tunkai, for, for your very kind introduction and invitation. I'm very grateful to be here contributing to this very interesting workshop. So as you heard, my name is Emilio Martinez Pañeda, and I'm an associate professor at Imperial College London. Today, I would like to talk about how phase field methods have opened new horizons in the modeling of corrosion damage and hydrogen embrittlement. So let me start by introducing the phase field modeling paradigm that we keep hearing about. The thing is that many engineering problems revolve around interfaces. And mathematically, we have two ways of dealing with interfaces. One is by treating the interface as a surface without a thickness, for example, a two-dimensional manifold embedded into the 3D Euclidean space. Or alternatively, we can treat the interface as an object with a finite thickness by using an auxiliary phase field variable that tells us where the interface lies. So for example, here we have two faces and the phase field variable takes a distinct value in each of the faces, zero and one, and varies smoothly in between at the interface. And as you can imagine, there are multiple benefits associated with this idea of having a diffuse interface. One of them is that the interface equation is defined in the entire domain, so there's no need for a special treatment of the interface. Another benefit is that topological changes such as divisions or merging of interfaces can be easily simulated and without any ad hoc criteria. And a third benefit is that the interface equation can be easily combined with equations describing various physical phenomena. So it is very well suited for multiphysics problems. And this is something that we have exploited in my group. And this paradigm goes all the way back to, to Van der Waals, who model a liquid gas system by means of a density function that vary continuously at the liquid gas interface. But only recently with the help of computers, it has really taken off in numerous fields in science and engineering. Two areas where phase field methods have gained remarkable popularity are microstructural evolution and fracture mechanics. As you can see in the slides, very complex interfacial phenomena can be simulated, such as the branching and merging of cracks, the nucleation of cracks from secondary sites, and so on. So the computational benefits are clear. And at this point, the question becomes, what is the differential equation governing the evolution of the phase field? Well, that, of course, depends on the physical nature of the interface that you're simulating. In microstructural evolution, one predicts the change in shape and size of microstructural features such as grains, usually by defining an evolution of the phase field in terms of other fields such as temperature concentration through a thermodynamic free energy. In the case of fracture mechanics, several models have been proposed, but the one that I will be discussing is the original one by Bourdain, Frankfurt, and Marigo. And the reason why I have chosen to elaborate on this model is because it shows how phase field models can be used to provide a platform for Griffith's energy balance. As you know, engineers and scientists move away from the rigorous thermodynamics framework by Griffith to embrace, to embrace local stress concepts such as stress intensity factors, which are more friendly to analytical and, and numerical solutions, but come at the cost of imposing additional arbitrary criteria for predicting the crack growth direction and extension. So I find it very beautiful that phase field allows us to go back to the origins of fracture mechanics, as you say, to exploit the potential of these energetic approaches. So let me briefly show you how the phase field equation can be derived from Griffith's energy balance. As you all know, Griffith postulated that a crack will grow if the energy stored in the solid is sufficient to overcome the energy required to create two new surfaces, a competition between the string energy density and the material toughness. And Frankfurt and Marigo formulated Griffith's energy balance in a variational form so that crack propagation can be predicted naturally as a result of the competition between the elastic and fracture energies without ad hoc criteria. So minimizing this functional is all we need, but the problem lies in that we cannot track this interface gamma, the crack surface. And here is where the phase field paradigm comes to a rescue because we can use the phase field as a marker, transforming the surface integral into a volume integral and enabling us to solve this global minimality problem. And two things that you will notice here is that the phase field degrades the stiffness of the solid. So it acts as a damage variable going from zero in intact material points to one in fully cracked material points. And secondly, the so-called crack density function involves a gradient and consequently a length scale. So the model is non local, which ensures mesh independent results as long as the mesh is fine enough to resolve this length scale. So at the end of the day, we have a model that is physically sound based on Griffith and the thermodynamics of fracture and at the same time, computationally very compelling. You can get a good overview by looking at the balance equations. The first equation is the solution to the deformation problem, the standard balance of linear momentum with the phase field degrading the stiffness of the solid. And the second equation 
is the phase field evolution, sort of a competition between the strain energy density of the solid that increases with mechanical straining and the toughness and material property. So just by solving this simple system, we can predict in both 2D and 3D very complex cracking patterns such as branching, merging, initiation from arbitrary sites, complex trajectories, and without convergence issues or the need for remeshing. For example, in this slide, you can see crack branching due to the application of dynamic loading. And here, as you say, red colors denote areas where the phase field equals one, so cracks. But before I say a few things more about how to solve the system, let me say something about the phase field length scale, as this is something that comes up very often. From a numerical perspective, having a length scale is very convenient as it regularizes the problem. But this, of course, comes at the cost of having one additional parameter. And people wonder about the physical meaning of this parameter. There have basically been two approaches to this. Initially, the length scale was considered to be only a regularizing parameter, and it has been demonstrated using gamma convergence that the regularized functional converges to the Griffith functional as L goes to zero. Another approach is to consider the length scale to be a fixed material property. And if you solve analytically the homogeneous 1D problem or run a uniaxial one element calculation, what you get is what you see in the slide. So a stress strain curve that resembles the traction separation laws of cohesive elements and where the critical value of the stress, where the critical value of the stress, the material strength is governed by the choice of this material length scale. And you can see the connection with the first approach. If the length scale approaches zero, then the strength becomes infinite as predicted by English and linear elastic factor mechanics. But of course, in reality, materials do have a finite strength and thus considering a finite value of the length scale is sensible in fact, phase field models go beyond Griffith and naturally capture the transition for, from a fracture-driven failure to a strength-driven failure, thanks to the role played by this length scale. So you can recall the concept of a transition flow size, which is widely used in standards and design. If a crack is larger than the transition flow size, then one uses fracture mechanics. Otherwise, failure is driven by the material strength. This is naturally captured in phase field fracture, as you can see in the slide. So the summary is that for short cracks or in the absence of cracks, the length scale matters as it controls the magnitude of the strength. While for large cracks, crack initiation will be toughness driven. You can see on the picture on the right that cracking always starts when the critical energy release rate is attained independently of the value of L. But you can also see that if you have an elastic plastic material, then the crack growth resistant behavior is gonna be influenced by the length scale as you will get more or less plastic dissipation depending on the material strength. And now let me take you back to the system of equations. Remember that in addition to solving an equation for the displacement field, we have an equation for the phase field, implying, implying that the phase field is an additional nodal degree of freedom. And remember also that these equations are coupled. The phase field reduces the stiffness and the displacement solution will change the strength energy, strength energy density. And there are two obvious options to solve this system. One is what we call monolithic schemes where we solve the displacement sub problem and the phase field sub problem at the same time, simultaneously. This is ideal and in principle efficient as the system is unconditionally stable. However, the total potential energy functional is non-convex with respect to the displacement and phase field solutions. And this causes convergence problems as the Jacobi metrics in the Newton methods becomes indefinite. Another approach is to use a staggered solution scheme by which both systems of equations are solved sequentially. First, we get a solution for the displacement field and then with the resulting strain energy density, we compute a solution for the phase field. This is very robust, but the solution can be sensitive to the time increment use. However, there's a third option that combines the best of both approaches. If quasi-Newton solutions algorithms are used, such as the BFGS one, then a monolithic approach can be used without any convergence problems. Quasi-Newton methods are very robust when dealing with non-convex minimization problems. We have shown that this is true for the conventional phase field formulation, and Wu and co-workers have also shown this for the phase field cohesive cell model. Let me briefly show you some results in this regard. What you see on the slide is a classic phase field benchmark, a square plate with a crack subjected to uniaxial tension. The solid is elastic and fracture occurs in an unstable fashion. So the crack propagates suddenly across the entire width of the plate. And you can see on the right, the force versus displacement curve that one gets from the simulation in red. You can see that there's a sudden dramatic drop of the load carrying capacity as a result of the unstable crack growth event. And superimposed, you can see the load steps taken and the number of iterations per each load step. So I want to emphasize two things here. First, you can see that the method is very robust. Calculations run in a couple of minutes and the entire fracture process 
can be captured up to a complete rupture of the sample with only 30 load steps. However, you can also notice that the critical load step requires slightly more than 200 iterations to converge. This is a characteristic of facial fracture simulations. The scheme is very robust and convergence is always achieved no matter how nasty the problem is, but critical time increments might require hundreds of iterations. And you can see here the comparisons with a single pass stagger scheme. You can see on the left that stagger in, in the case of stagger schemes, the force versus displacement result is sensitive to the number of load increments used as in explicit or forward Euler types of analysis. And you can see on the right that achieving the correct solution with the stagger scheme requires a number of iterations that is two orders of magnitude larger than with the quasi-Newton solution schemes that we are proposing. And I will end this part just by saying that quasi-Newton solution schemes can be of great importance to the emerging area of facial fatigue, because one can also extend facial fracture to mortal fatigue by incorporating into the equation a fatigue degradation function that evolves with the number of cycles. This is an approach that has been pioneered by Laura de Lorenzis and her group, so I suspect that she will be saying something about it tomorrow. From a numerical perspective, the key thing here is that the Stucker approach deviates from the real solution within each cycle, accumulating error and leading to inaccurate predictions. You can see in the slide a plot of crack extension versus number of cycles, and you can see that many hundreds of increments per cycle are needed to reproduce the accurate result, which, which is captured by our monolithic question approach with only four increments per cycle. So cycle by cycle predictions are very powerful as they enable quantifying fatigue damage for arbitrary choices of material, geometry, and loading history, but they are computationally very expensive and the cost becomes unbearable if one uses a starter scheme. And we have had quite a lot of fun in the past two, three years working with phase hill fracture methods. Some of our pioneering contributions include the first formulation for fracture and functional grid materials, which is what you see on this slide. So the fracture behavior of functional grid materials is very interesting as the material property gradient introduces mixed mode conditions in otherwise mode one fracture scenarios. So the facial method is very convenient to capture the resulting crack trajectories, as you can see in the comparison with experiments at the top. And here you can see how the phase field compares with other methods in a classic computational benchmark. The crack trajectory is very similar, but the key difference is that the phase field approach has the ability to predict crack nucleation from arbitrary locations. So the calculation doesn't stop when the crack reaches the hole. Without the need for remeshing, it can capture how the crack will nucleate again and up to the complete failure of the sample. We have also developed the first phase field fracture formulation for shear memory alloys. These materials undergo phase transformation from astenite to martensite due to stresses or a change in temperature. And this of course impacts the crack behavior and the material resistance to fracture with the toughness being dependent on the martensitic volume fraction. With our formulation, we can capture those effects and the toughening associated with the martensitic phase transformation. We have also extended the model to fatigue and we have showcased its potential by simulating the fatigue failure of an etanol biomedical stand, which is what you see here on the right. And a third piece of work that I want to highlight is our efforts in extending phase field to predict the failure of fiber reinforced composites. This is work led by my friend Wei Tan. Uh, as you can see, we can resolve the microstructure and we can simulate 3D effects to quantify phenomena such as fi fiber bridging and many others. But what I mainly want to talk about today is the coupling of phase field fracture with multiphysics problems. And there's one chemomechanical problem that is particularly important, hydrogen embrittlement. This was something that was also highlighted by dear Robert yesterday. The issue is that metals exposed to hydrogen experience a very significant reduction in ductility and fracture toughness, as you can see here. If we increase the hydrogen content coming into our metallic samples, we observe a very noticeable drop in the failure strain. And the same goes for the toughness. In fact, the reduction of fracture toughness can be of up to 90% in some alloys. So hydrogen makes our otherwise ductile metals very, very brittle. And this of course has tremendous implications as you can imagine, as hydrogen is the third most abundant element on the earth's surface. Thus hydrogen embrittlement has been a well-known concern in offshore engineering where metals are exposed to particularly aggressive environments. And the problem has gotten significantly worse through the years, mainly for two reasons. First, the higher susceptibility of modern and high strength alloys, which we use in our bridges, trains, cars, buildings, leading to numerous and this is leading basically to numerous hydrogen assisted failures. And of course, due to the promise that hydrogen holds as energy carrier of the future, we already have hydrogen fueled cars, buses, and trains in the market. And you can imagine how problematic it's going to be to store and transport hydrogen for all these applications. So there's a strong need for models 
reliable models that can capture the underlying physics and that can predict hydrogen assisted fractures at scales relevant to engineering practice. And these models are going to be multiphysics and multidisciplinary as this is basically the nature of the beast. There's still many things that we don't fully understand, but we do know that hydrogen coming from water vapor, gas, or an electrochemical solution enters the metal, diffuses through the crystal lattice, and accumulates in areas of high hydrostatic stress or high volumetric strains where the lattice expands and there's more space, there's more space for the hydrogen to accumulate. Then in the fracture process zone, hydrogen interacts with the metal in many ways and at multiple scales, changing the dislocation mobility, reducing the atomic bonding strength, and so on. So capturing everything is, is quite a daunting task, but we know that at the very least, a predictive model has to capture the diffusion of hydrogen and the interplay between mechanics and chemistry. So in addition to the balance equations for the displacement and the phase field problem that I showed you before, we have an additional equation for hydrogen diffusion, which is basically an extended version of Fick's law. And you can immediately see the coupling with the mechanical problem via the hydrostatic stress. And I must say that I've written here the simplest formulation for hydrogen diffusion. In reality, hydrogen not only diffuses freely through the lattice, but it also trapped on microstructural sites such as grain boundaries, dislocations, carbides, and so on. So we have also developed more comprehensive models that can capture the role of multiple hydrogen traps and, or resolve the electrochemical diffusion interface. And those introduce some additional couplings, as you can see here. Anyway, what I want to discuss here is the coupling with phase field fracture. And the way we do that is by defining a degradation function that reduces the material toughness. I remember I was once told that we were the first to introduce a degradation function that multiplies the toughness, an approach that is now widely used for fatigue or even ductile damage phase field models. I don't really know if that's true, but to me, it just seemed the natural thing to do. What experiments show at the end of the day is a reduction in toughness with increasing hydrogen content. And the key question then becomes, how does that degradation function look like? Well, of course, the beauty of this approach is that it's universal so that it can accommodate any mechanistic interpretation. One can decide to define this degradation function to be dependent on the lattice hydrogen concentration or on the total hydrogen concentration or on the hydrogen trap at grain boundaries or on the dislocation density or in any other macroscopic or micromechanical parameter that you think is involved in the fracture process. And of course, you can also come up with empirical degradation laws that you can fit to experiments. So in the next few slides, I will elaborate on our choice for this degradation function, but I emphasize that the platform is universal and can accommodate any belief. So when coming up with a degradation function, the key question that I wanted to answer was, how does hydrogen make metals brittle? How can it be that a metal that fails in a ductile manner through microvolt cracking exhibits very brittle behavior in the presence of hydrogen with, for example, grain boundary decohesion, as you can see here for nickel. So the goal here is to be able to capture this ductile to brittle shift that we observe in the presence of hydrogen without ad hoc criteria, just by explicitly resolving the mechanisms as a natural byproduct of the simulation. Our rationale is based on three main ingredients. The first one is that atomistic calculations show that the bonding strength between metal atoms is reduced with hydrogen co-occupancy. You can see here a plot of surface energy or fracture energy versus hydrogen coverage in two types of grain boundaries in nickel, as obtained with DFT calculations by a group at SIMDEF. You can see that if your grain boundary is full of hydrogen, so an occupancy of one or close to one, then the bonding strength is reduced by 40%. So that is the first key ingredient to develop a mechanistic understanding. If we have enough hydrogen, the cleavage strength or the grain boundary strength will be weaker. So the key question now becomes, how much hydrogen do we have in our grain boundaries? Where are we here in the x-axis? Because if the occupancy is low, then this might be as well a secondary mechanism. And the answer comes from the chemistry and the uh, thermodynamics of hydrogen trapping. Using our Yannis equilibrium, we can plot the trap occupancy as a function of the binding energy of the trap site and the hydrogen concentration in the lattice. And you can see that strong hydrogen traps like grain boundaries with uh, binding energies on the order of min minus 40 kilojoules per mole are essentially full of hydrogen for lattice concentrations as low as 0 0.3 ppms. So it is very energetically favorable for the hydrogen to reside in grain boundaries. And this has been recently confirmed experimentally with atom probe tomography. This is from a recent science paper, and you can see how this grain boundary, the red region, is full of hydrogen atoms. So our grain boundaries are definitely gonna be weaker. And when you take into account this reduction in strength in fracture energy, then you naturally see those weakened interfaces failing if you introduce enough hydrogen. 
And the theoretical lattice strength of the grain boundary strength is, are both on the order of 10 times the yield stress. But if you consider the 30, 40% reduction resulting for the hydrogen and an appropriate description of crack tip stresses, then the numbers match and you have a convincing story that requires no fitting parameters. And what I mean by an appropriate description of crack tip stresses is a long story that I decided to drop for the lack of time. But the summary of it is that we know from experiments that the critical distance for hydrogen assisted cracking is a few microns ahead of the crack tip. So if one has to sample precisely the stresses at such a critical distance, and if you're using a continuum model, then the way to do that is by using strain gradient plasticity. So we typically couple what I described before with a higher order strain gradient plasticity model, but I won't get into those details today. So essentially what we have done is to develop a couple deformation diffusion fracture platform, which builds upon the phase field fracture method and a mechanistic and implicitly multi-scale hydrogen degradation law. So, so the steps are as follows. First, we solve the couple mechanical diffusion problem. We need to know how much hydrogen we have, where and when. Then when can use thermodynamics of trapping to determine what is the occupancy, the coverage of that critical interface that we're interested in, for example, grain boundaries. And then we can go to those atomistic calculations that are run offline and determine how much the fracture energy is degraded. So everything's done without any fitting parameters whatsoever. The phase field hydrogen degradation law is essentially the DFT relation between the fracture energy and the hydrogen coverage. And in the case that I'm showing here, corresponding to nickel, the degradation law is linear, as you can see here, and the parameter in blue equals 0 0.41. So everything is taken care of. And then our fracture energy becomes dependent on the hydrogen coverage of grain boundaries. And if you, I take you back to the simple one dimensional homogeneous problem, you will see that the phase field traction separation law, so to call it, degrades with hydrogen content. And there's one more chemomechanical coupling that I want to show before going to the results part. One effect that you would like to capture when modeling hydrogen diffusion and fracture is how the hydrogen concentration of the environment follows the crack tip as it propagates. So if you have a crack propagating in a wind turbine monopile, for example, you will expect the seawater to immediately occupy the newly created crack surface. So this, as you can see in the slide, can be achieved easily using a penalty approach when you're using this facial fracture method. So this is the crack growing, and this is the hydrogen concentration from the environment following. So let me show you some representative results obtained with the fully coupled mechanical diffusion facial fracture model. First, these are R curves, crack growth resistant curves, the applied K, so the load will be on the Y axis, or so proxy for the load is in the Y axis, and the crack extension is on the X axis. And what I'm showing here is the sensitivity of the crack growth resistance to the hydrogen content. You can see that in agreement with expectations, the higher the hydrogen content, the smaller the fracture resistance. And what you see on the slide are results obtained for different loading rates, showing how the model captures another well-established experimental observation. The faster the loading rates, the less time the hydrogen has to reach the fracture process zone, and thus the higher the crack growth resistance. Let me move on to show a few representative quantitative comparisons with experimental data. For example, what you see on the slide is a comparison with tensile tests on pre-charged notch steel bars, showing a promising agreement in terms of failure stress versus pre-charged hydrogen content. And here you see a set of interesting experiments where notch duplex stainless steel samples were held at a constant load in a seawater bath. These are experiments dotted in TEF. Each sample is subjected to a different constant load. And then you just wait for them to fail to see what was the critical failure time. And you can see that all of them fail at a relatively early time from an engineering perspective. But what we can do with our model is not only reproduce the experiments, but also run simulations over very large time scales to see what is the critical stress below which engineers can load their structure safely. So these agreements with experiments gave us the confidence to go beyond the lab into field applications, I mean at enabling a virtual testing paradigm for hydrogen sensitive applications. These are a couple of toy examples. The first one deals with a crack propagating from a 16 pits due to corrosion. And the second one simulates crack propagation in a lifting equipment made of high stand steel. And here you can also see that we can run standardized experiments. So we can do these sort of virtual experiments. This is a particularly interesting case as the failure of bolts and screws is a well-known problem in hydrogen abrittlement because they use typically very high strength alloys. And the problem involves the exposure of a metallic screw inside of concrete to an aggressive solution. And you can see here that we can capture the complete failure process capturing this B-material contact interface, 
and up to the complete failure of the screw. But more excitingly, we can model large scale 3D problems and correlate our models with inspections, creating sort of a digital twin for critical infrastructure. Here you can see a pipeline containing multiple defects due to pitting corrosion that has been characterized by La Rosa and co-workers using non-destructive evaluation, ILI rendering actually. It is a 12 kilometer pipeline and we model a critical section of three meters that contains more than hundred defects. We are not limited to model cracks, but we can model defects of arbitrary geometry. And of course, note that in phase field models, because one solves for the damage variable as a degree of freedom, it is very easy to introduce those defects. So you just need to assign an initial condition to the nodes located in the damage areas. And then you can load the in service conditions to predict when failure will happen. And this is shown in this video where you can see how defects start growing over here in the top, how they eventually merge and then finally lead to the this complete failure of the, of, the, of the pipeline. So this is basically a pipeline subject to the conditions of a riser. And this looks a little bit like a video game, but I should emphasize that this is a sophisticated multi-physics model. Everything is computed on the original finite element mesh in an implicit backward Euler framework without any convergence problems and fully parallelized such that it can run in a few hours. We have a tool that allows us to know how the crack will propagate and when it will propagate such that we can decide when to replace the component or what are the limit service conditions. Finally, we have extended the framework to fatigue. We just need to add a fatigue degradation function like the one provided by Laura. And then we can deliver predictions based on the material toughness and nominal material properties. For example, here you can see how we can produce virtual SN cures with and without hydrogen, reaching a very good agreement with experiments. And we can also predict the influence of hydrogen on party's low coefficients or deliver virtual SN cures for any geometry. I emphasize that the party's low behavior and the SN cure are an output of the calculation, not a, pr a prediction, not an input. So no bells, no whistles, just an energy-based approach based on the thermodynamics of fracture and a mechanistic hydrogen degradation law. And I will end this talk by showing very briefly another exciting avenue of research, the use of facial model to capture how the surface of a corroding metal evolves. We all know that corrosion damage is a big problem for society and its prediction is a massive challenge for scientists and engineers. In fact, the vast majority of the research conducted in these areas experimentally has long been considered to be a too complex problem to model computationally. One of the biggest challenges from the computational side is capturing how the aqueous electrolyte solid metal interface, so this interface between the electrolyte and the, and the metal evolves in time. As you can see in the video, which is basically, by the way, a synchrotron analysis for corrosion in stainless steel, multiple firms, multiple pits will form at this interface, interact and under certain conditions they will transform into cracks. But this bottleneck can be tackled if we exploit the face seal paradigm and implicitly track the evolution of this electrolyte metal interface. The differential equation for the evolution of the face field is based more on face field model, models for microstructural evolution and solidification rather than the fracture models that I've been discussing so far, but I won't get into details for the sake of time. You can find them in the paper. I will only say that in addition to the phase field that represents the dissolution of material, one typically solves for the diffusion of metal ions in the electrolyte. We have also decided to solve for the mechanical problem and we have incorporated for the first time the influence of mechanics in the corrosion kinetics and the film repositivation and rupture model, which are very important phenomena in, in, in corrosion problems. And these are just some representative results to show how the model can capture pitting corrosion and the pit to crack transition in both 2D and 3D. So it's very compelling. And we have validated our model predictions with experiments, as you can see here, showing a very good agreement, both in terms of yeah, the crack extension, the shape of the, of the defect, of the stress corrosion crack defect, and its sensitivity to the mechanical fields. And last but not least, we have recently developed a generalized formulation for stress corrosion cracking. So depending on the environment, you could have fracture driven by anodic mechanisms and metal dissolution or by the uptake of hydrogen, basically hydrogen and brittle mechanisms. So we have developed a multi-phase formulation that combines both phase field corrosion and phase field hydrogen assisted fracture to capture the interplay between these mechanisms and the transition from one to another with changing environment as you would see in the experiments but I, I don't have time to get into this. So this is just an appetizer. So time to wrap up, just uh, four high level concluding remarks. First, discovering the phase field fracture method has been fantastic. It is physically sound and robust. It can capture 
very complex cracking phenomena in both 2D and 3D. For example, coalescence of multiple cracks, crack branching, crack nucleation from arbitrary sites, complex crack trajectories, everything without any ad hoc criteria, just the minimization of that energy balance. We have also proposed new efficient solution schemes for facial fracture, and we have extended the facial fracture to areas such as shape memory alloys, functionally green materials, and the micromechanics of fiber reinforced composites, just to name a few. And we have developed a phase field based multi physics mechanistic framework to predict hydrogen invertement in laboratory tests and practical applications. We have also seen that the phase field paradigm can be used to tackle the long standing challenge of modeling localized corrosion, pitting, and stress corrosion cracking. And I think that we're going to see a revolution in this field similar to the one that we're seeing in phase field fracture because it truly opens amazing modeling possibilities. That's all. I will just finish by thanking you all for your, for your attention. Of course, thanking my sponsors and saying that all our codes are openly shared, mostly developed in Navacus, but also Phoenix and, and Comsol. And I will also say that I'm looking for a, I have an advert for a postdoc in phase field modeling of corrosion that will close soon. So in case someone is interested, thank you. Thank you very much, Emilio. So the talk is open for discussion now. Yes, Lorenzo. Hi, Emilio. <clears throat> Great talk, congratulations. Just a curiosity. Can you account for uh, modes two and three of crack propagation in your model? Does it, is, is, is it relevant? Thanks, Lorenzo. Nice to see you. Uh, yeah, so the, the thing is that I guess the beauty of, of this facial fracture models is that they can actually capture those things naturally. So everything is driven by the minimization of this energy functional. So you will have, if you have the loading conditions intrinsic to mode two and mode three, and have been, I haven't worked on it, but there have been a number of papers looking into this, you can naturally capture those sort of in-plane cracking and all those modes without having to decide, without having to have an ad hoc criteria to decide where the crack will go and so on. So that's, that's one of the beauties of it, that it comes naturally into the, into the model. Okay, thank you. The, the crack just chooses the most energy favorable path and it could be a mixed mode path of mode three and mode two. Yeah, okay. definitely, thank okay. you. Thank you. So yes, Yuri Kadin. Uh, uh, thank you a lot for very, very interesting talk. I have a question. Yeah, uh, I just uh, wonder, uh, you showed comparison of phase field method with more classical ones like finite elements or extended finite elements. I wonder uh, whether there is a comparison was ever done with another non-local method like phase field. I refer to peridynamics in terms of fracture. Yeah, thank you, Yuri, for your for your interesting question. Actually, a very interesting one. I, I yeah. So I guess this is the kind of comparison that you were doing. Myself, I've been working on computational fracture mechanics since I started my PhD, and I've tried XFEM, I tried Cushing some models, and I never experienced the, the the excitement that I have now with with facial fracture. Is truly, in my opinion, it truly outperforms all the other methods. Um, I must say, I never tried peridynamics. There have been a couple of papers out there comparing peridynamics and phase field. I have a collaborator here at Imperial that works quite a lot with peridynamics and we have been working in comparing them in the context of, uh, in the context of a fracture of nuclear fuel pellets. And what I can say is based on, on just a first taste of the method, I haven't encoded myself or used it myself, but through what our students are reporting, what we can see is that both are very powerful. Both are very powerful non-local approaches. In fact, in that problem that we're looking at, both models are the only ones we can find so far that can actually del deliver the right predictions. And this is the impression that I get from other papers that have been published, showing that both seem to capture qualitatively the kind of cracking trends that you would expect, very complex cracking trends. I think the only thing that uh, I would note in favor of phase field when we were doing that comparison is more from a computational practical perspective. So we have seen that phase field uh, calculations seem to take much less time to run. But again, take this with a pinch of salt because this could be influenced by by our particular implementation of peridynamics and phase field. It could be that other implementations, this changes. Mm -hmm. And another thing that we have, we have noticed, of course, is that phase field fracture can be very easily incorporated into a finite element code. Well, peridynamics requires a bit more effort. Mm -hmm. So for example, I think, in my opinion, this is the reason why phase field will uh, become dominant, I would say, because it's very easy to incorporate it into, for example, Comsol have already incorporated phase field fracture in the latest version. Uh, well, I suspect that incorporating paradynamics might be a bit more challenging, but I might be mistaken there. I don't, I'm not an expert in paradynamics. Mm -hmm. And I think that the key takeaway is that both methods are very powerful. So if you have the time to 
to implement both and, and to work with both, then uh, both can do the job. There are, of course, some people commenting on other aspects of, of prairie dynamics. I think Basan has a paper on that, but I, I never really dip myself mm. into that, so I won't comment on that. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, there is one more question from Mehmet Dordenji at yeah, Mehmet. Uh, hi, Emilia. Thanks for your nice presentation. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, while I was listening to your presentation. So Thank I have you. a quick question. Basically, it doesn't take you know, so much time. So how about the dynamic fracture efficiency in phase field? I mean, so can you comment on this a little bit more? Dynamic? Yeah, so we haven't done, it's a good question as well. I have, we haven't done much work on that. This is a dynamic fracture example. Mm -hmm. um, I think the reason why we haven't done much work on this, well, most of our problems are quasi-static. So I can tell you my impressions from the little work that we have done. In this case, this simulation that we're doing, we implemented this into Abacus. And the problem with Abacus is that since you need to solve two equations, so you need to solve one for the displacement and one for the phase field, the phase field you solve it in a quasi-static manner, so to say, so you solve for a given strain energy density, you get a phase field, while the displacement equation in you will typically solve for an acceleration in, in, in a dynamic calculation. So the reason is that we are constrained due to this in, in the context of Abacus to use Abacus standard, which means that we need to solve the dynamic problem implicitly. And because you need, of course, very small time increments to resolve the, oh, the wave okay. phenomena that are happening, it can be very time consuming. But there's two workarounds to this. And if, if dynamics was an, of interest to us, we will take any of those two approaches. One is what uh, Tom Hughes has been doing. So if, you're all, if you use your own implementation, then you can easily solve explicitly the, the, the displacement problem and then it becomes very efficient again. And then the other approach is what Yuri Brasiles has been doing at Brown, where they propose this hyperbolic phase field fracture. So you could solve in commercial codes as well for the phase field as an acceleration. And that, of course, is not exactly the same equation, but they seem to show similar results. Oh, then, yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question. And I have one more like quick question. Uh, it, it was on page 17. Uh, you showed an example of a single edge and crack problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in this case, so what is the like influential uh, parameters on the on the determination of the force? Like for example, what is the effect of the like crack width in the equation you showed like L, uh, LC or L, I forget the name. But, so is it influential like determining the crack width in this case? You mean the phase field length scale, right? That's what yeah. we were wondering. So I think this, this goes back to this, this slide, I guess. So, or this one maybe. So basically the role of the lens scale is that the lens scale governs the, the, I mean, ideally in the first models of lens scale was intended to be a regularizing parameter that goes towards zero, but of course uh, you can never make it equal to zero in, in a practical scenario. And also it's not convenient to make it equal to zero in the sense that the lens scale governs the strength of the material. So there's this relation here. So your choice of lens scale is gonna govern the strength. Yeah, so I basically, if you have a large crack, which is the example there, then you don't really care that much about the lens scale. Results are not gonna be sensitive to the lens scale because they're, they're gonna be driven by, by the toughness. And you can see that here, right? This is, this is K1, but you can think of G divided by GC. It always happens at the same time when G equals GC, basically. There's no, cracking always takes place at the same time. And in that problem before, it was unstable crack growth. So here, boom, the crack will just grow suddenly and you will get exactly the same result with similar lens scales. However, there could be problems where your crack is small or maybe your cracks in somewhere in this middle region. And there the lens scale is gonna play a role because basically the strength plays a role in the fracture behavior of those boundary value problems. And also if you have an elastoplastic material, then the strength plays a role in how much energy dissipates during your fracture process. So then the lens scale again, through its connection to the strength is gonna play a role there. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank yeah, so uh, I, I hope it will not uh, so much question. So, I have another question about like multiple cracks. Like what I mean is how do you handle the multiple cracks? Like uh, you need to specify some crack lengths, right? For those cases as well. Like so I guess that the pipeline is a good example of that, right? So here we just define, okay, these are we have multiple defects. We define initially the phase field is equal to one in these locations. And then we just, I mean, it will do it automatically. We just load. This is the beauty of it, right? You don't need to remesh, you don't need to tell the crack in which direction it has to go what extension it has to grow. Yeah, which, exactly. So then you could just load to in-service conditions and then the crack will just find a way through the most energy convenient path and, and merge and, and coalescence and so on. So that is, that is the beauty of it. Yeah, 